afternoon, everyone, or morning for our friends on the West Coast and in Alaska. This webinar is brought to you by the Division of Energy Assistance Office of Community Services. The Office of Community Services is a division within the Administration for Children and Families under the Department of Health and Human Services. My name is Christine Shalantano, and I work as a LIHEAP Tribal Training and Technical Assistance Program Manager for Tribal Tech. This is the second LIHEAP Tribal webinar in a series of two for this current fiscal year. It is Tribal Tech's job to furnish training and technical assistance to LIHEAP Tribal grantees. We do this through developing materials for conferences, webinars, travel for on-site technical assistance, and visits and tribal roundtables. As part of our scope, we work collaboratively with other contracts under the Division of Energy Assistance, including their prize team, who is furnishing training and technical assistance on performance management. A prize has agreed to help us out today, providing tribal grantees with some information on what state grantees are doing on performance measures and how tribal grantees might be able to take advantage of that. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Sharnice Peters. Sharnice is a program analyst with the Division of Energy Assistance. Sharnice? Hello, everyone. And again, uh, welcome to the introduction to LAHI Performance Measures for Tribes webinar. Thank you, Christine, for introducing me. I am the OCS Policy Analyst, Sharnice Peters. And I would like to start off by mentioning that OCS has been working closely with state grantees on collecting performance measures data to help illustrate to the administration and Congress the value of the LAHI program. In contrast, HHS is not currently collecting this data from tribes, therefore tribes are not required to report performance measures data. However, if you are interested in reporting or improving your understanding of performance measures, I advise you to reach out to your OCS regional liaisons so they can arrange for our contractors to furnish the appropriate T and TA to you. Um, next slide, please. So over the course of this webinar, we will explain the LIHEAP performance measures process as well as the state reporting requirements. This will then tie into why and how performance measures are valuable to planning and implementing the LIHEAP program. Afterwards, we will discuss how tribal grantees can access and review their state performance measures data for informational purposes. And lastly, we will respond to and I'm sorry, we will respond to questions raised during this webinar as well as the relevant issues mentioned at the National Conference training sessions. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I want to talk a bit about why this is relevant to tribal grantees. Currently, state grantees are required to report on various performance measures, while tribal grantees are not required to do so. Therefore, current information shared on a national level does not include tribal LIHEAP performance and effectiveness. So first, any information that you are able to collect and report provides an opportunity to raise the LIHEAP tribal grantee voice in reporting about the effectiveness, I'm sorry, the effectiveness of the LIHEAP program at the national level. Second, as state grantees have enhanced their data collection and reporting procedures to meet the new performance data reporting requirements, it gives you an opportunity to work collaboratively with states who may already be collecting important sources of data and can result in more effective and efficient data gathering, gathering experience for tribes. And finally, since state grantees are developing new procedures for looking at LIHEAP performance, I'm sorry, LIHEAP program performance, Tribal program managers can use some of those techniques to look at your own programs and consider what changes you might want to make to improve your program performance, such as making more informative adjustments to your benefit matrix or even prioritizing specific um, populations, you know, things of that nature. Next slide, please. So now it is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce our next speaker from a prize, Mr. David Carroll. David Carroll has more than 30 years of experience conducting research on LIHEAP and other low-income energy assistance and energy efficiency programs. He is currently managing a team of contractors who are furnishing training and technical assistance to LIHEAP grantees on performance management under the contract to the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Community Services. And with that, I will turn it over to David. Hello, everyone. <coughs> Um, just want to let you know, a prize is a nonprofit research institute dedicated to collecting and analyzing data and information <clears throat> to assess and improve public programs. Our current research includes work for the federal and state governments, 
agencies, utility companies, and nonprofit organizations. Uh, a prize furnishes training and technical assistance to grantees on LIHEAP reporting and performance management. We've been focused on state grantee performance reporting since tribal grantees are not required to submit those reports. However, our work scope includes responsive training and technical assistance, meaning if you reach out to us um, to, for tribal grantees to request assistance. Um, OCS defines performance measures as something to help LIHEAP managers assess how well they are implementing their programs. And results of this assessment and analysis may help to improve the LIHEAP, um, LIHEAP reach in their communities. And so that, of course, is relevant to any program manager, um, not just state grantees, but also tribal grantees. Uh, um, as we start this discussion of LIHEAP performance measures, one important thing for tribal grantees to understand is that state grantees have been granted and used considerable flexibility in the types of assistance that they offer to clients. Most grantees offer more than one kind of assistance, and some offer all of these types of assistance. Um, so they offer heating assistance, that's direct assistance with home heating bills. Uh, many states now offer cooling assistance, uh, with direct assistance with home cooling bills. Um, states are required to offer crisis assistance, that's emergency assistance with home energy bills. They're required to um, uh, save a certain amount of funds so that they can deal with those crises late, crises late in the year. Um, equipment programs where they do repair or replacement of heating or cooling equipment. Assurance 16 where they do delivery of services to foster, foster self-sufficiency. Weatherization where they do delivery of energy efficiency to clients. And finally, nominal benefits which are a special purpose benefit. However, since states have so much flexibility in how they use funds, OCS has decided that they need to ask grantees to collect and report uh, quite a bit of information on the households that they serve and the way that they use available funds and the impact that those funds have on program participants. Um, in particular, they need to, uh, the LIHEAP grantee, state grantee reporting system requires uh, a state plan with very detailed information on how the grantee plans to use their funds a household report where they have to report on the number and type of clients served by each of the different program elements, uh, um, as well as an unduplicated count of all the households they serve. Performance data form module one, which is known as the grantee survey, where they describe the sources of funding and how they use the funds for the different program measures. And then finally, the performance measures data form module two, which is LIHEAP performance measures, in which they furnish some in information on the impact of the program. There are some major challenges. <clears throat> there are a number of important challenges that grantees face in completing the reports. Specifically, the development of an unduplicated count of clients served by the program. So clients can often be served by a regular grant, a cooling grant, and a crisis grant, and OCS requests that they furnish information on the unduplicated count of those <clears throat> Households. Uh, second, uh, uh, they need to document where funds were obligated, um, even if they were not spent within the program year. And most recently, on um, collecting and reporting information on client energy expenditures that they need to obtain from few energy vendors, as well as service restoration and service loss prevention data that they need to obtain uh, from the client and from the uh, uh, subgrantees. The LIHEAP state grantee reporting system serves several purposes. First, communication. They it helps um, they report to the it helps OCS to report to the administration, Congress, and the public on how LIHEAP funds are used to meet the statutory purposes. Management. OCS uses the information to review the technical aspects of grantee programs 
and to alert grantees to statutory and regulatory requirements. Um, grantee program performance. OCS encourages grantees to use the information to, gener uh, to enhance performance of their own LIHEAP programs. And then finally, grantee best practices. OCS and grantees use the information um, furnished on these reports to identify and replicate grantee best practices. Um, LIHEAP is a block grant, um, and so states have considerable flexibility in what, how they administer their programs, but OCS still needs to report a set of performance goals, needs to set performance goals, and to report on those to the administration annually. Now we're going to move on to identify the specific performance measures and talk a little bit about why they are important to LIHEAP. There are two existing performance measures and four new developmental performance measures. Elderly, they, and they include elderly household targeting. Do grantees target elderly households in um, in terms of who they serve by their program. Young child household targeting. Do grantees target young child households? Benefit targeting. Do high burden households get the largest benefits? Burden targeting. Do those households get the, a larger share of their bill paid than the average household? Service restoration. How many times does the program restore energy service to a client or household? Service loss prevention. How many times does LIHEAP prevent the loss of service? <clears throat> Why are these important? The general approach taken by OCS and the Performance Measures Implementation Workgroup in the development of performance measures is that they should be directly related to the objectives and mandates in the LIHEAP statute. Since the statute specifically mentions targeting vulnerable households and high burden households, those are included all as measures. But since the overall purpose of the program is to help clients to maintain their energy service, the PMIWG members wanted to be sure that those also were included as measures. Here are some concrete examples of the statutory language that is relevant, particularly to targeting performance measures. Um, for those of you who have never looked at the statute, it's pretty easy to find on the OCS um, website, OCF LIHEAP website. And there's good information in there. Sometimes people will ask you, why is the LIHEAP program designed the way it is? And you can find a lot of information in there about uh, what, who exactly is supposed to be targeted and how uh, funding is distributed. Here are. Uh, here are some concrete examples of the statutory language that is relevant, particularly to targeting, to targeting performance measures. So first of all, it says that the secretary is authorized to make grants in accordance with the provisions of this title to states to assist low-income households, particularly those with the lowest income, that pay a high proportion of household income for home energy, primarily in meeting their home energy needs. Um, then it goes on to define the term highest home energy needs means the home energy requirements of a household determined by taking into account both the energy burden of such a household and the unique situation of such households that results from having members of a vulnerable population, including very young children, individuals with disabilities, and frail older individuals. And they even uh, later in the, <coughs> um, in the assurances, they want the um, grantee to assure, ensure, uh, assure that they will conduct outreach activities designed to assure that eligible households, especially households with elderly indiv individuals or disabled individuals or both, and households with high home energy burden are made aware of assistance available to, under this title and any similar energy-related assistance available under subtitle B of Title VI relating to community services block grant program. So the, the stat, the, when Congress wrote this bill, they were very, they very much were directing um, HHS and the individual grantees, including both states and tribes, um, that they had a purpose for these funds and that it include targeting both vulnerable households and high burden households um, in terms of receiving benefits.
On a more practical level, what we find is that households who appear to be very similar have, can have quite different energy burdens. So let's look at this example. Family one has an annual energy bill of $800 and an income of $8,000, meaning they have an energy burden of about 10% of income. If family one gets a grant of $600, their net energy bill is $200, and they have a net energy burden of only 2.5% of their income. When people talk about um, energy affordability, generally they'll say, if you can get someone's energy bill down to below 6% of income, you're, um, you're making their energy bill uh, um, affordable or at least approachable. <laughs> um, but in this instance, we're seeing a family number two who has an energy bill of $1,600 and income of $8,000, meaning they have an energy burden of 20%. If that family gets a uh, grant of 600, their net energy bill is still $1,000, and their net energy burden is 12.5% of income. And so, in this, ex <clears throat> um, the expected outcome is that family one probably will be able to pay their energy bill after LIHEAP, while family two is still likely to have trouble paying. But if you reallocated funds to give $400 to family one and $800 to family two, family one still probably would be able to pay their bill, and family two would have a better chance of doing so. But if you don't have the household energy expenditure data, there's no way to make that determination. Um, and, so the, and one of the surprising things is that as when we look at households and their energy use, and we use just good basic indicators for um, how much, for what their situation is, we find that households have very different energy expenditures, um, uh, even though they appear to be very similar. Okay, now I'm gonna turn to um, a question of how you can get information on state grantee reporting and LIHEAP performance measures. While I, <clears throat> so while I hope this introduction, this is a useful introduction um, to LIHEAP performance measures, it clearly does not give you the detailed information about the complete LIHEAP state grantee reporting system or complete information on the LIHEAP performance measures. To get more information about that, you should access the training and information on the LIHEAP Performance Management website. And the way that you do that um, is you first have to get a username and password. Um, you can uh, you go to this link, contact John E, that's John English at NCAT.org, and request the username and password. Um, the training materials, you can go to the LIHEAP Performance Management website, log in with your new username and password, then go to grantee resources, information for grantees, training, performance management web, webinars. And we're gonna show you how to do this in just a minute. Um, and that'll allow you to um, both see detailed um, uh, review slides on previous training for state grantees, and also listen to uh, webinars that we've conducted both on how to collect and report performance measures and um, this spring in how to make use of performance measures for program management. So the next, um, okay, I'm going to the next slide. So here's an example of what the performance measures website looks like. And you can get access to this website even without a username and password. However, if as a LIHEAP grantee, you do get a username and, access, a username and password, you can get access to additional information on LIHEAP performance measures. So one of the things I'd mentioned earlier is that on this grantee resources page, so this is the tab, um, there's a lot of information on uh, training. And so if you, um, I'm gonna go to another, the next slide. What I'm gonna show is happened, so what you, um, if you click on this link here, if you get a copy of the slides and you click on this. Um, so here's the link to the grantee resources page right here. 
to click on the Information for Grantees tab. Then on the Training tab, so uh, Information for Grantees is right here. You click on that and then it will go to Training. You click on that and you'll be able to access YouTube videos on our uh, on our, of our training on performance measures. And again, this information you can get without a login ID. That doesn't mean we, that we do encourage you to get a login ID so that you can get full access to all the resources, but you can get this directly without, uh, right now without getting a user ID. Another component of the uh, Performance Measures web website is the data warehouse. Um, and this, this link, here's the link to the data warehouse page for the guided search for the single state program reports. This tab will allow you to get detailed information about the state programs for the states, state or states in which you're located. These reports are, avail again, available without a login ID. Um, and you can actually get a lot of information about the, the state in which you reside, including um, information uh, if you, when you get to this page, if you um, arrow down, uh, if you just scroll down, you'll get information on their performance measures um, data for um, 2016. And what you'll be able to see is in, so if you're in Montana, you can see in Montana, what does the average household who receives LIHEAP what are their energy expenditures look like? What's the distribution of those households by main heating fuel? Um, what are um, the electric costs of some of those households? There's just a lot of information there that is likely to be similar to what your households are experiencing, even though they're not currently covering your, your clients. And again, the data warehouse is available without um, a login ID. However, you, you as LIHEAP grantees are eligible to receive a login ID and a password, and you can use the entire website. Um, when the site was launched back in 2013 at the training in San Diego, um, uh, all state grantees and tribal grantees were, uh, uh, had a, a username and password made available to them. But if, you've, um, if you don't have that at this time, you just reach out to John English. Um, and when you, log in, when you go to the page and you say, I want to log in, this is what it's going to look like. So you can click on this page and it'll, uh, this link, and it'll send you to the login page. And then John will send you a username and password. And you'll be able to um, uh, log in to the rest of the performance management uh, website. And here's what, you, uh, here's what it looks like once you log into the website. You'll, uh, you will note that you can now see the grantee forum uh, where state grantees uh, have been discussing performance management issues and some of the um, challenges that they've faced. And then you also will see that over here is a tab for performance measures. Um, those are not currently accessible to public users. Um, sometime during fiscal year 2019, they will be made available. But uh, we wanted to give state grantees the opportunity to look more carefully and look and develop a better understanding of their performance measures before we open that up to the public. Um, and uh, and again, it's it's kind of a you know there are a couple different. Uh, the, the performance measure, oh, so the, um, when you go, sorry, and here is what it looks like uh, when you go to the performance measures tab. This furnishes detailed information on the entire set of performance measures, including what they are and how the grantee can use them. I hope that some of you will be able to take a look at these materials. Uh, remember that we are happy to furnish one-on-one -on -one uh, assistance with anything that we've just presented. So if you, for example, if you're in Oklahoma and you want to get a better understanding of what the data for, what the data show for Oklahoma, um, uh, one of my staff can walk you through this entire section on performance measures for Oklahoma as well as some of the other data from uh, uh, 
some, as well as some of the other data that's been developed from the household report and the grantee survey. Um, and that will give you a pretty good picture of what's going on um, uh, with uh, what's going on. Okay. Um, it, what's going it give you a good understanding of what's going on in your state. It'll be able allow you to think about what your clients look like compared to what the clients look like who the state is serving, and to and that'll help you. You know, I know one of the things that they've been talking about is establishing new state tribal agreements, and I think that the more information everybody has about clients, the more productive those conversations are going to be. So, many state grantees have had to develop new capabilities in order to meet the requirements to report an unduplicated count of LIHEAP clients and to report on LIHEAP performance measures. In addition to getting new information about LIHEAP clients in your state from the performance management website, you might also consider new outreach to the state grantees to discuss ways that you can leverage the information they are collecting. In this webinar, Brenda from Wyoming is going to talk to uh, about ways that they've worked with and are planning to work with their tribal grantees to share information and resources. Other examples include Oregon, who has given the Klamath tribe access to their system for purposes of ensuring that grantee clients are getting benefits from only one source, but also to ensure that when a tribe is out of fund, agencies from, na uh, agencies from neighboring areas are alerted uh, to that and can help to serve the clients who are still in need of benefits. We're also aware that Casey from Oklahoma is developing a new LIHEAP system and has made a commitment to the Oklahoma tribes that he will work with them to determine how that system can be leveraged to help tribal grantees uh, manage their programs. If you're interested in getting a better understanding of the performance measures or if you want to start an initiative to develop and use performance measures in your program, should, you should contact us for support. As I said earlier, our work scope involves responsive TNTA to tribal grantees. Uh, we're ready to help anyone who requests that assistance, uh, but at this time we're not going to be reaching out to uh, tribes and, and um, uh, uh, instructing them on what they should be doing. This is not what they should be doing, but what they can be doing. So I did want to spend just a couple of minutes going over again the details of the uh, procedures that were implemented in Oregon, and they've been in place for quite some time. I think more than a decade ago, Oregon developed a new IT system, um, and when they did that, they um, and when they did that, they actually uh, came had made an agreement with the Klamath tribes to give them access to that IT system um, at no cost. And I know that that was one of the things that was mentioned at the. Um, at the national training was that some tribes would like to get access to the systems, but often, but some states are asking the tribes to pay for uh, that access, but Oregon um, is making that available. Um, so Klamath tribes have access to the Oregon IT system at no cost, but they still operate their program independently of the Oregon state system. Um, one of the things that they want, uh, so the one focus of this is duplicate payments and eligible for payments. All agencies, local and tribal, can see all clients who have been processed for payments so that no clients receive duplicate payments, um, getting a payment from a, a state agent uh, subgrantee and from a tribal uh, office. And states can see, the state can see when tribes in a certain area have no more funds and once that happens in Oregon, what they do is they alert the other agencies in that area that they can deliver benefits to tribal mem members during that period. So you can see how um, uh, that kind of a relationship with the state can um, uh, benefit your, your clients. The other thing that's true is um, that um, Oregon does is they actually invite the tribal staff to the training because the, the, in order to use that system effectively, uh, the staff need to be trained, and they make again they make that training available at no cost. And since the program are similar, that reduces tribal training costs and helps to update tribal staff on any new updated uh, system procedures. So that's one positive interaction between the state and tribes in terms of IT information sharing. 
Um, now Brenda is able to join us. Uh, so Lisa uh, Gobin from Oregon was interested in joining us today, but she's in the middle of a, I think she's either in the middle of training or just about completing training. So um, I was speaking for her based on some notes that she sent to me. Uh, but uh, good news is that Brenda from Wyoming is available to us. Brenda Ilg is the LIHEAP uh, program manager in um, Wyoming. And she's had some pretty good interactions with the tribes in her service territory, in her state. Um, and she's going to tell you a little bit about that experience. Hi, everybody. And um, one of the things that uh, came to my attention a few years ago was our northern Arapaho tribe came to the state. And uh, we had had a really, really tough winter that year, and so they ran out of funds uh, very much earlier than, uh, you know, would be normal or um, you would expect. And so we started having conversations, and uh, we got together many stakeholders from both the tribal program and uh, leaders and elders of the tribe, as well as uh, state office personnel and myself, and started having conversations around a table. And uh, very early on, it very much felt like somebody had sort of set the bowl of cookie batter down in front of all of us in the middle of the table and asked us to identify what was in the batter without giving us the recipe. And that was kind of what we had when we were all trying to figure out, okay, well, how have we in the past determined the allocation for the tribal programs? Um, we kind of had that bowl of batter without the recipe. So we, we began there thinking, boy, you know, we, we really do need to uh, formalize this. We need everybody's input. And we need to get this down uh, in more of a formalized document. So we began the discussions for what became our memorandum of understanding between the Northern Arapaho Tribe and the state of Wyoming uh, LEAP program. And so uh, as we were doing all of you know, our initial meetings and everything, it became really, really clear, I think, to both sides that we all had one common goal, and so, and that was serving all of the eligible households in the state of Wyoming to the best of our abilities with the resources available. And so that was the common goal that really drove everything and laid the foundation. So we began drafting our state tribal agreement, and uh, in doing so, we formalized the method for calculating uh, the tribal allocations. And actually, you know, we began writing the recipe, if you will, the road map. And um, we included data uh, in, in the determination that we received from the tribal, uh, tribal folks. And we compared that with census data and some other data. But we felt that uh, by inviting the tribes to also provide us with that data that they had, um, we got a more accurate representation of the eligible households in their service territory. Uh, so, we, so we think you know, uh, we were using better data in the formula to calculate that allocation. And um, it did end up in uh, some increases to the tribal allocations for uh, actually for both of the tribes. And we, we also have the Eastern Shoshone in Wyoming. Uh, we outlined the types of uh, data that the tribes and the state would share back and forth in that state tribe agreement. Uh, we specified service areas. And then uh, we also had a responsibility section for both 
the state agency and for the tribal agency, which just clearly, you know, said what are obligations to each other and what our obligations to the clients that we serve were. And so that that now is in place. We have this state tribe agreement, and it has just really been a very positive uh, experience, I believe, in that it has so opened up a collaborative uh, communication and partnership uh, that, for example, now, you know, I travel uh, out to our tribal partners' offices on a regular basis. I'm uh, set to go there here in the near future again. And, you know, we collaborate on different things. I share information uh, with the tribal partners, not, not so much in the way that oh, here's a better way, or this is the way it should be done, but more in the sense of, you know, here's, here's an example, here's how we do it at the state program. And then I also uh, will refer them to, you know, some of the federal resources that are out there on the websites, some of those that David just mentioned, um, so that they can also get some other examples and, and not just, you know, look at one example as, you know, they're making decisions for their own program. Um, we, we also collaborate on some of the client service issues. Uh, those certainly came up in some of our discussions as we were developing the MOU, um, you know, and that was, I think, uh, really beneficial because while we share some common um, client issues, service issues, there are some that are also very unique uh, to the tribal program. And, you know, had we not started having these communications, I would not know that. I wouldn't have a good understanding of the tribal LIHEAP program. Uh, they didn't really have a real clear understanding of the state LIHEAP program. So now, I, you know, we understand each other's program. We understand some of the unique client service issues that each has. And we also recognize what those common client service issues are. And, and now we can brainstorm together to come up with uh, solutions, whether it be for some of those commonly shared issues or, you know, the, the more unique ones. Um, and one that, that has come up quite a bit is, you know, issues surrounding uh, benefit matrices and, you know, are, are we uh, delivering the benefits uh, always to those households that are um, most vulnerable? Are we lowering the energy burden uh, more for those higher burden households, that kind of thing? And I think sharing since we started collecting the data at the state level, being able to share some of that data with our tribal par partners um, has helped them, you know, uh, develop some ways that they can uh, track some of their data a little bit differently or more efficiently and, uh, you know, use that data then to, to make those kind of programmatic uh, policy decisions. Um, another thing that we did was we invited our tribal partners to, um, a, we hold an annual vendor meeting with our fuel suppliers and utilities, and we started doing this as we were gearing up to prepare for the light heat performance measure data collection. And it, it was viewed so positively by our fuel partners that we have kept doing it. So we, we began to invite our tribal partners because one of the client issues that often comes up in, or, or, and the tribal LIHEAP program uh, issues is dealing with some of the fuel vendors. Um, and so we thought, well, here's a great opportunity uh, for you to come and talk about those things directly with the fuel vendors and begin to build 
those kinds of relationships or improve upon those relationships, whatever the case might have been. Um, so we did that, and uh, the Northern Arapaho uh, LIHEAP program manager a couple of years ago, three years maybe, uh, actually did a presentation to the fuel suppliers and utility partners that were at that annual meeting where he was able to highlight, um, you know, some of the unique issues the, that they see with, with the clients that they serve uh, and the housing stock and, and cost, of, you know, fuel prices and things as they related to uh, the Wind River Reservation. So that, I believe, was, you know, a very helpful thing for both the fuel vendors and, and the tribes. Um, I'm going to quickly touch on some next steps because I know we have limited time today, um, but I would certainly welcome any questions uh, now or even at a later time. Uh, and one, I just mentioned the energy vendor issues. Um, with one vendor in particular, uh, the tribe was experiencing some, some real issues and were concerned that maybe uh, tribal clients were being charged at a higher rate than other customers. Um, because we're collecting the data that we are now at the state level, I was able to pull up uh, the information as it related to uh, clients we served through the state program using that same vendor um, so that we could do some comparison and see, uh, you know, was that happening? And then begin to, you know, ask some questions uh, related to that and, you know, basically why. Um, we also have shared our fuel supplier rights, responsibilities, and agreement, which is our vendor agreement in Wyoming. It just has a very long name. And uh, we shared that as an example with uh, our tribal partner. Um, this year we're going to uh, add some tribal language in our state uh, vendor agreement, hoping that that will uh, maybe provide some, some teeth in terms of, you know, the whole section where, you, can, you know, you're not allowed to discriminate against uh, a customer because they are a LIHEAP recipient. So we're going to uh, include, you know, whether they are with the state LIHEAP program or the tribal LIHEAP program. Um, and, and we'll see if that helps in that respect. It's a simple thing to do, but it, it may be able to assist uh, with some of those issues. We're currently making some IT enhancements. And one of the goals, not going to happen immediately, but we would like to add a tribal portal so that our tribal partner, uh, partners uh, could access the data at the state level. They could look up a client and, you know, uh, see whether the client received benefits at the state level. We, you know, and likewise we could then, um, you know, share to make sure we're not duplicating services. Uh, if a tribe then ran out of funds, you know, we could look up and see that it had not been, uh, had not received uh, tribal funds and we could uh, serve them through the state. So we're looking at doing some of those kinds of IT things. Um, I, I really love what Oregon has done. I think that uh, really is, you know, the an ideal setup, if you will. And then, you know, ongoing collaboration, uh, I think, is just is key. We are all partners in this together. And, you know, knowing what you can do once uh, you start gathering data in terms of uh, designing your program, making policy decisions. Uh, for example, we have the what if tool now. Um, and I uh, am going to show that to my tribal partners and work with them on, you know, looking at ways that you can change your benefit matrix a little bit and maybe get uh, better, uh, uh, better target your high burden, more highly burdened households uh, and use your resources 
more effectively and more efficiently uh, to serve your eligible households. So I'm excited to have that tool and to be able to uh, collaborate and, and communicate some of, some of that with our tribal partners. So it really is, you know, just, just find your friend and begin the conversation. Um, it's, it's been a really valuable experience for us in Wyoming, and I, I think on both sides. Thank you, so Brenda. I will... Yeah, that sounds, sounds like a lot of progress there, and I, I thank you so much for sharing that with everyone. Um, we are going to open this up for questions and answers, so if anyone has questions for either Brenda or David or even Charnice, um, go ahead and um, let, raise your hand <laughs> and uh, or type it in the chat box, and we'll get those questions answered. Hey, this is uh, Patrick Strickland uh, with the Lumbee Tribe. I, I don't have a question. I, I have a comment. Um, I'm glad there's focus finally being given to tribal um, performance measures. My experience with NEWAC and taking part in the LAHIP Action Day that takes place in D.C. is that it's important, um, that that is important when talking about LAHIP with con congressional leaders. Um, there's always a lot of state data available to discuss that um, he just talked about, but the, the data does not necessarily represent tribal grantees. Um, so this approach on, on tribal performance measures is critical not only for large grantees, but also for the smaller grantees. Um, so I hope um, there's good participation in collecting the data because, as I said, it's critical to show how tribes are utilizing these funds and how um, the impact that it's made on those communities. So. My follow up. Thanks, Patrick. What is NEWAC? Can you tell us what that is? Um, NEWAC is the um, a national coalition um, that is, represents state um, agencies, tribal agencies, and utilities that uh, represent uh, LAHEAP advocacy and funding issues um, on the national level. Okay, thanks. Does anyone have any other questions? There's a lot of information today, so I know you might be thinking about your questions, but certainly we'll, we'll wait on you, and feel free to ask anything in relation to the topic. It's new for most tribes, so um, just thinking about it and dabbling in this area is not something a lot of tribal grantees have done yet. So we have a question from Lisa Watson Woodford. And she asks, do you have examples of how to request data from an energy vendor? I guess that'd be for you, uh, David, and or Brenda. Um, <clears throat> so yes, uh, many state grantees ask that very same question. And so what we did is we developed some templates uh, for how to make an information request to an electric company, to a natural gas company, to a propane vendor, or to a fuel oil vendor. And you can find those in the public sector. So if you go to the, public, to the website, and again, you don't have to have a username and password to get there. You go to grantee resources. Uh, you click on that. And then, um, and then you can, let's see if I can, if I can go back to that page just quickly. Um, what you can see is that there's this thing called, oops, sorry, <laughs> I went too far. Um, you can see there's this thing uh, called Tools for Grantees, and under that there are some process guides, and those will give you templates that you can use and fill in um, if you wanted to uh, collect, uh, work with your energy vendors to collect data. David, this is Christine. Is, are they pretty approachable for the most part? Do people feel like they have success using these templates and asking for that information? Um, so I, I think that that's going to, they are generally approachable, but of course they're going to, um, they're going to be a little bit hesitant at first. Now the first thing that you should know is that every state is currently collecting data from uh, the, every state is currently collecting data from the top five electric companies, the top five natural gas companies, the top ten propane companies, and the top ten 
fuel oil companies. And if you have clients who use one of those companies that have already been approached by the state, you might consider uh, working with the state to request the data for your clients. However, if you've got clients that are being served by uh, local municipal electric utilities or co-ops or a local fuel vendor, um, uh, uh, you probably should approach them directly. And, and again, if you talk to your state grantee about any experiences they've had, they can share those. Um, and then if you use the template, that, that clarifies exactly what you're requesting. Um, and in general, people are pretty responsive. One of the things, um, Minnesota has a very uh, extensive system where they collect information from 90% uh, of their energy vendors, including hundreds of propane and delivered fuel uh, vendors. And one of the things that um, I asked the person who manages is that, um, you know, don't these small vendors have a problem furnishing you the data? And he said, no, actually, they're some of the best people in furnishing the data because they know Mrs. Jones, they know Mr. Smith, they know Mrs. Jones's bill is $1,500 this year. They know Mr. Smith's is only $750, and they just think it's fairer if Mrs. Jones, you know, if they get that information, if they send that information to the state, they know that Mrs. Jones will get a bigger grant, grant, and that'll help her pay her bill, and Mr. Smith will get a smaller grant, but he'll still be able to pay his bill. So, since they know their clients directly. It can, uh, it can really help them to understand uh, the program and to make sure that it's working, you know, working in partnership with the grantees. Thanks. Does anyone else have a question for David or Brenda? If not, I'd, I'd like to ask another question, David, as a follow-up. So, <clears throat> In, the, in many tribal communities, they're very small. Everyone knows everyone, right? And um, benefit payments, generally, that information can be shared. So have you come across uh, any method for helping community members understand that there are differences in the burden, which can look very much the same, but actually is different, say, if there's 10 people in a house and there's, you know, two people in another house of the same size is a very different energy burden there. Have you come across any strategic ways of being able to explain that or where grantees are explaining that difference so that people have a better understanding that everyone's being treated fairly? Okay, I, Christine, I think that's a great question. But I'm going to, I, it's always good to know what you don't know. And no, I, I don't know how clients think about, I don't know how communities and clients think about what's fair and what's not fair. I did, you know, for example, uh, say report that the, the utility, the delivered fuel companies, fuel oil and propane companies that uh, the people in Minnesota work with, they very much have an understanding that if somebody has a really high bill, you need to give them a good high benefit to handle it. But how, you know, how um, individual households and clients think about what I get versus what somebody else gets, I don't have a good answer for you on that one. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. I just thought I'd ask because it comes up when we go um, on technical assistance visits. You know, people try to be appear as fair as possible. And so that, I know that's a question that probably lots of people have. Is you know, it's possible. Else? There is this research that says paying 6% of your income for energy is a good target. And so that might be one way to describe the fairness is we're trying to get everybody to an affordable energy bill. You take somebody's income, you figure out what 6% of it is, and you try to give them a big enough benefit that they're, they only have to pay 6%, you're going to at least give them a fighting chance to pay their bill. So that might be a kind of a tool that you would use. Um, you know, if somebody got a very high bill and a very low income, to get to 6%, they need a pretty big benefit. If they've got a reasonable amount of income and a modest energy bill, with a smaller, uh, with a smaller benefit they can get to that target. 
So you might be able to make use of that target uh, just in conversations. Yeah, that's a great idea. It's a good place to start anyway while people are thinking about this. I know many tribes are looking at revisiting their benefit matrices and, and maybe taking a second look and seeing how to develop those so that people are served more efficiently and effectively by the tribe. So if there are no more questions, um, I don't see any in the chat box, and I don't see anyone's hand raised, um, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. But before we do, I wanted to remind everyone online about a couple of resources that are super helpful. Um, the LIHEAP website navigator is, you can find that on the OCS website. It looks like the icon on the left, and um, it takes you to the page of the screenshot on the right. And there's a variety of resources there. Um, you, you click on the button that you're interested in, and it'll give you links to different areas under each button. And you can find yourself um, searching a little more effectively because there's a lot of resources out there between a lot of different entities that are providing training and technical assistance. So um, I encourage you to, you can click on the link here in this PowerPoint presentation and it'll take you there. And then the second one I wanted to mention is the peer-to-peer -peer network, also an active link there. And this is an opportunity for especially new coordinators um, or seasoned coordinators, I know we have a couple online here, uh, to help others and or get help from others. So if you're seasoned, you've done this a long time and you have you know, information to share, uh, then this is the place to put your experience <laughs> into to work to help others. So tribal grantees could be um, paired with another tribal grantee. Either you can be helping or you can be receiving help. But click on that link to get more information about the peer-to-peer -peer network and um, see if that's something that's right for you. So I want to thank all our pre presenters so much for giving us all this valuable information. And thank you all for attending. At the end of this, you'll receive uh, a short 